Welcome back to the bluegrass. This beautiful May day. It is 56 degrees. The sun is shining. The grass is green, and the kennel is full of a wide variety of dogs of various types and sizes and ages. And so today, I thought this would be a perfect time for me to make a video about exercise. Okay, guys. So listen. Here's our our kind of basic working premise: is that uh, exercise prevents and or reveals problems. It doesn't cause problems. Okay. And so throughout this video, just keep referring to that. That's my basic premise. And this can be part one in this series because I know people will have something to say about it. But listen, that's my operating, uh, <laughs> that's my operating principle right there. Every morning I get up and I come outside and I know that the first thing on my agenda is going to be to get the dogs out, get them moving, and uh, to do interesting stuff. My personal theory is that a dog trainer's real job is to help owners remove the impediments that stand in the way of going out and living a rich life. Okay? You'll never convince me that anything's more important than actual real life experience in teaching a dog how to navigate today's uh, you know, kind of somewhat stressful and semi-urban uh, and maybe even urban environments that we put them into. You know? like dogs don't really need much in the way of training when you live on a farm. You know, I mean, dogs are bred to behave in a certain way, and as long as you take and you put them in situations where their genetics match the expectations, they do about perfectly. Where a dog trainer comes into play is helping you take a dog that was bred to live one lifestyle and adapt to living a different lifestyle. So we're going to walk around and we're going to talk about how, back up there a little bit, cameraman, and show them some of the different things these dogs are doing. You'll notice Oaks here, who's going to have his own video on kind of being aggressive. Uh, he's trying to hump everybody. We have this uh, farm dog here, and she's, she's kind of playing, but playing in a rough and tumble way. We got a few dogs carrying around sticks over here and playing, okay? Look, guys, I don't have, <laughs> I don't have the ability to teach dogs more than what they're learning in, when they're in this environment, okay? Uh, what happens is where my teaching comes into play is making sure that these dogs can come when they're called, be still when they're told, and have good manners so that their owners can take them out, put them in a wide variety of circumstances, and let those circumstances do the teaching. We follow a Montessori approach here. We shape the environment and the environment shapes the dog. So we never get out of our lane in what we consider is important. We get up and we exercise these dogs because exercise, proper exercise, leads to good physical fitness, it leads to good mental fitness, it leads to good energy regulation, it leads to good hygiene, and it leads to good social skills, okay? And you're just never gonna convince me that exercise does anything other than prevent or reveal problems, okay? We're gonna go up to the small challenges course so I can kind of flesh my specific uh, uh, positions out uh, one at a time using these various dogs because I know there's some common myths out there and they're gonna show up in the, in the you know, in the comments section about how much you should exercise a puppy, about in what conditions you should exercise a puppy, all that kind of stuff. So let's walk up to the small challenges course right now and I'll kind of be a little bit more specific. But if you just want to stop this video here and do what Uncle Stoney says, here's what Uncle Stoney says. Get out, get moving, be interesting, and use the chances that you have to exercise your dogs to, to promote, a, you know, physical and mental fitness in both yourself and the dog, okay? Like, like <laughs> it's really that simple. If you'll get out and do fun stuff, then that fun stuff will be reflected in your overall attitude towards life. You know, so you're going to have a better time if you're in good shape. And every, everybody has to agree on at least that. So we're going to go up here. Come on, dogs! We're going to jog up here so I can get these dogs to kind of follow along. <laughs> and I want you to watch as I'm running. Like all these dogs, they're different movement patterns, you know? And uh, see, all this kind of stuff here. See, a little bit of tussling now and again. Guys, you know, the dogs are just like children. When you take your child to the football field, when you take them to the soccer field, when you take them to wrestling, they're gonna have a little conflict here and there. And by, you know, using those exercise sessions as a chance for them to fully develop their innate social awareness, then those little conflicts that they have while they're young prevent big conflicts later. So always keep that in mind. I know a lot of you, you don't, you, you haven't had very many dogs. A lot of you, you know, you don't have a lot of experience with children and, and rough and tumble play or physical work uh, or even necessarily much in the way of contact oriented sports. 
okay? But listen, there's a real crisis in the world, both with, uh, with children um, and with dogs, just not knowing how to like, be physical. You know, and that at our kennel, we fight that every single day. You know, I could build a giant building and house 200 dogs at a time and leave them in their runs and get them out and go, he'll sit down or, or click, treat, click, treat. I could do that, okay? But what I would be doing is I would be selling a service that's not really meeting the needs of my clients, okay? And that's what we're here to do. We are here to meet the needs of our clients and what I want, the type of clients I want and the type of clients that, that hire me want to go out and they want to live interesting lifestyles and they want the dog to tag along and to be happy and healthy and safe, right? And so that's what we're always about and it begins and ends with exercise. All right, so we're gonna walk some dogs. Now, those of you who are familiar with my channel, you understand that this is my small challenges course, and this is where we teach our vocabulary and our physical skill set that enables us to go out and find cool and interesting spots to adventure in or you know, uh, have uh, good training sessions in. Uh, now, we need a definition, right? So like I told you, that so we have a vocabulary. Like here, our training vocabulary is pretty simple. You know, come, let's go huff, easy, wait, and stay. Our skill set's pretty simple, right? But like talking to other people about dogs, sometimes that vocabulary is not quite as simple, okay? So let's just, let's just maybe start with a basic definition of exercise. Let me find one of these dogs here. We'll use Shay. Come here, Shay. All right, now Shay's a, she's a nice little one-eared German Shepherd. And uh, now, so with Shay's owner, it's very easy uh, to talk about exercise because he was a professional baseball player and he understands the value of exercise. He understands how, you know, like a good exercise regimen is reflected in your physical and mental state. So for those of you who don't maybe do a lot of athletics or aren't in like, you know, athletic endeavors with animals, um, the way I look at exercise is pretty simple, right? It's just an activity that's carried out in furtherance of mental and physical development, okay? So we want to encourage and sustain health. That's what exercise is. So when you see me come out here and get moving with these dogs, okay? Like I'm gonna take Shay and I'm gonna walk around my little small challenges course. Come on, Shay. Up. Like with Shay, like she's a good dog, but I mean, she's a German Shepherd, so she gets, uh, she can be a little barky sometimes. She can be a little bit what people will sometimes call reactive, right? So I've got to take her out and I've got to understand that, I've got to make her understand that there are certain things that have to be done uh, regardless of the environment that we're in. And so I need to be able to use some words that she understands. More importantly, I need to be able to use certain types of vocalization, certain types of posture to communicate my expectations. And I need to make sure that she is uh, like well-versed. Hey, uh, she is well, <laughs> if you're wondering what, <laughs> Uh, what I just yelled at. Okay, so my son has this real fancy adventure van and he's got a bumper made by a company called Illumines. Now they are the best bumpers made, but they have a little rubber <laughs> like cover on the key latch and the dogs love to eat them. <laughs> and so like you get, uh, like they're not cheap, right? So that's why I had to interrupt my video to yell on, so I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, but back to what I was talking about with Shay. So I need her to understand what's expected and I need her to be able to perform uh, the activities that are expected in the broadest range of physical conditions possible. So I come over here and, uh, you know, I, I talk to her a little bit. And as I'm talking to her, I show her what those things mean. So like right here, I say hup. It's a catch-all term we use for negotiating obstacles. Easy, be aware where your body is, wait. Okay, see how simple that is? Watch, easy, little jump, little hup, little climb, little hup. Again, it's a catch-all term. Easy, up, up, up. pay more attention to how I'm talking than what I'm saying, up, 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 up. Because how I'm talking is what's important. Did your mom ever tell you? Wait, it's not what you say, but it's how you say it. Well, that's especially true with dogs. So like for us to be able to preach that we want you to, you know, go out and, and exercise your dogs, well, first thing, if you want to go out and exercise your dogs, guys, you have to have a dog that understands what's expected and will reliably exhibit the behaviors that are expected regardless of what's going on in the environment, okay? So I understand that, you know. I understand that some of you are in a position to where, like, you're like, uh, Stoney, like, my dog doesn't mind well enough yet uh, to go out and do, a, you know, a, a big adventure. Yes, it does. It does mind well enough. It's just going to take a little bit of extra work on your part, okay? And each time you go out and you adventure, well, then uh, it's going to get a little bit easier, all right? So we'll grab another dog. <laughs> okay. Well, listen, managing all these dogs is crazy because they all want to get on the camera and hang out with Uncle Stoney and be YouTube famous. But we'll use, uh, 
threat for the next part of our video. Okay guys, exercise is an adaptive process. So the first point I was making with Shay is that I need a good vocabulary and a good set of physical skills so that I can feel comfortable taking her out and letting her engage in a lot of mentally and physically challenging activity. Now here's the neat thing, and we watch it all the time, is that there's a thing called an adaptive stress response. And what that means is that, you know, when you, when you exercise, like your body basically prepares itself for the next exercise session, okay? So like you take a, we get a lot of these golden retrievers in and a lot of times, you know, the kind of people that buy golden retrievers, they want a nice soft little dog and they'll come out here and they get, uh, they get fatigued kind of easily and they kind of, you know, hang around and pretty chubby. And we get a lot of little English chubbies, little English labs out here and they start off pretty chubby. Wait, but after a week or two of being here, their body starts to really transform. And even though they'll always carry a little extra weight, okay, you start to be able to see a noticeable musculature around their shoulders and around their hindquarters. And you can see a nice tuck up in the abdomen. abdomen. I mean, basically guys, uh, uh, exercise, when the dog adapts to a good exercise regimen, you're helping your dog realize its full mental and physical potential. And there's just, you know, there's no way around that. I mean, I, you, you can watch my videos and you can see tons and tons of really healthy looking, happy, shiny dogs that have uh, clear eyes and they obviously have clear minds because you see them adapting uh, or interacting with lots of other dogs and lots of people and farm machinery and horses and pigs and all kinds of stuff. I mean, look at that dog. Doesn't he look like a happy, outgoing dog? So generally speaking, a dog's demeanor is a reflection of its lifestyle. And so if you go out and you do a lot of fun activities, okay, the joy of those activities will be directly reflated uh, reflected in your dog's mental and physical states, right? That's why I'm, people always, they, they always like comment on my channel, hey Stoney, how do you get such perfect looking dogs? You know, why do your dogs always look so healthy? Why do they look so happy? Guys, it's not that I'm like got, you know, some special eye for dogs and I can just pick dogs that are perfect. It's just, I get them out here and I get them moving and we do interesting things and that is reflected in both their attitude, okay, towards work and towards being social and in their physical states. Now, you do have to grade it on a curve. So let me show you what I mean by that. Back up there a little bit, cameraman. Just a little bit and show them this white dog right here. Now guys, this is Evie. And Evie is a Great Pyrenees. Now, for those of you who do not know what a Great Pyrenees is, a Great Pyrenees is what's called a livestock guardian dog. They're basically bred to go hang out with sheep <laughs> and chase off coyotes or wolves, right? That's, that's what they do, right? Now, so we'll walk Evie. And I want to, again, use exercise to help Evie be the best Great Pyrenees that she can be. But I want, to, I want you to watch her walk and watch how she walks very slowly and very methodically. And uh, so when I'm exercising the dogs, I make adjustments based on the type of dog that I'm exercising. Earlier, I picked Shay because she happened to be standing close to me. And Shay's a very athletic, working bloodline German Shepherd, okay? And so I hold her, <laughs> I hold her to a pretty high standard. Look, there's Black Sister. She's a farm dog. I hold her to a very high standard as it relates to actual athletic performance. Now, with a dog like Evie, she doesn't have that kind of raw athletic potential. <laughs> so this is what I get. She just looks at me. She's like, Stoney, I actually do not see any particular need to walk up on a board that's going to move when I can just walk around it. I understand that, but let's harken back to our first uh, talking point, which is I need the dog to understand my expectations and to be able to perform uh, in all environments. So if I expect her to walk politely on the leash and there happens to be an environmental impediment in play, I have to have her where she will, come on babies, come on, come on, where like, she'll be compliant, otherwise I can't take her with me, right? So like when I'm going to the farm or something, like I'll take Evie with me and just let her hang out, you know? And most of the time I can just let her hang out. But sometimes, I mean, so we have a big farm, you gotta go a lot of places. And so I've gotta be like, come on Evie, get over that log. And I can't very well be out working a whole bunch of dogs and have one that just says, I can't go, right? So that's the real key. Even though when I'm out and I'm doing my little adventures for exercise and socialization and what have you, I'm gonna take a wide variety of dogs 
And not all of those dogs are going to, you know, have the same levels of energy output, the same levels of endurance. They most certainly don't have the same uh, kind of recharge rates. <laughs> like when Evie gets tired, she just goes under the truck and sleeps for, you know, 20 hours. But I want to take them all. I want them all to have fun. There's that lab trying to eat that Illuminous bumper. Uh, I want to take them all. I want them all to have fun, okay? But I have to start with an objective evaluation of what's expected. That doesn't mean that I let her underperform. No. I want her to realize her full potential. I just make sure that when I'm setting uh, my standards for what constitutes her full potential, I'm being realistic. Now, some of you owners out there, you owners are Evie, okay? <laughs> So start, <laughs> listen, just start off understanding that about yourself, you know? Like, like if you're Evie, then you gotta be a little bit more creative with like how you structure your exercise sessions, right? Uh, or you gotta make a decision not to be Evie anymore. <laughs> Uh, but some are just naturally like Evie, okay? So if you're naturally like Evie, guess what kind of dog you should get? You most certainly shouldn't get uh, this uh, field bred hunting dog. Uh, you, you, uh, Oaks, come here. Come here, Oaks, what are you doing? <laughs> Look, if you're an Evie owner, you don't want this little high-strung Australian Shepherd that runs and barks and attacks other dogs all the time, you know? And so that's good. Now, like, you've got to kind of go the other direction too, though. If you are like a super athlete, right? And you just happen to buy a dog like Evie. Come on, babies. Because you like the idea of, you know, a, a dog that fights coyotes and wolves. And <laughs> then you got to be a little bit more objective. You got to go, okay, look, I bought a dog that, that you know, the, the chasing off coyotes is a, I mean, that's a real interesting story and everything. But the majority of their day, the majority of their life, 99.5% of their entire lives is just hanging out with sheep doing nothing. Right? So if you want a dog that does, if you want to you know, have an exercise session where you do a lot of stuff, buy this kind of dog, not this kind of dog. But if you buy this kind of dog, right, who's naturally kind of a lazy dog, don't just not exercise it. Because Evie loves to go. She loves to go everywhere this guy goes. They're big buddies. And Evie lives with a Newfoundland named Cole. I don't know where he's at right now. And he loves to go. They just get out of the truck and lay down and watch all the fun activities. So we still take them, we still exercise them, but we just kind of, you know, let them, let them be themselves. And we're just trying to help them be the best versions of themselves that they can be. Evie just looked at me. Y'all can't see this on camera, but she just looked at me like, Stoney, is this almost over? <laughs> Come on, Evie, we're almost done. So let me wrap this part of the video up with Evie. Come on, Evie, and we'll grab a different dog. Come on, come on. But notice how gentle I have to be. <laughs> come on, I'm being gentle, but I'm also being very insistent. And like, I think there's a, uh, <sighs> there's kind of a problem with dog training. Just really, it's just because people don't do much stuff anymore with animals. They don't work very hard in terms of physical labor anymore. And you don't understand that being nice, okay, uh, doesn't mean, it, it, it doesn't mean not holding someone or, or a dog to a high standard. Okay? Like if you really want to be nice, you have to help people and dogs realize their full potential. And that means you have to be insistent. You have to have high standards. I, this dog's not going to be a happier dog later on in life if I just mark her off as being, a, oh, well, Evie's just kind of a slow and lazy. I'm not taking her to the farm. That's not going to be fun to her. She still likes to go, right? It's like being a little kid. You want to play basketball with your friends, even if you're not very good at it. And if your friends pick on you a little bit, well, that just makes you tougher. Back up a little bit, cameraman, and show them. You see, like you can hear over here. See this old farm dog, like wrestling and playing and, and picking on that lab, okay? Well, this dog, it does that to a lot of the dogs that are out here. And then some of the bigger dogs do it to her. And that kind of rough and tumble play, guys, not only is it expending energy, but it's helping the dog uh, understand like what are the limits of that energy expenditure? When you don't take your dogs outside and exercise them, then it's really, you know, on a consistent basis, then it's really hard to socialize them because they have tons of pent up energy. And whenever they meet something new, a new person, a new dog, a new, you know, kind of livestock, or they get put in a new situation that uh, is full of stimulation, like there's traffic noise or cars or something, they just have too much energy uh, for, for, for them to organize and manage, okay? It really is just about that simple. All right, I'll grab another dog. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm at a point in the video to use this dog as an example. And Cole, 
<laughs> who hasn't had much exercise uh, because he's been laying in the shade, uh, he comes out and he says, hey guys, do you want to play? <laughs> now, if I would have had Cole out there running around with us, you know, if I would have pressed the issue, he would be asleep right now. But I let him lay up in the shade and now when everybody else is starting to get tired, he pops up and he's like, hey guys, what's up? All right, but this is the dog we're talking about right now. All right, now, so cameraman, come over here and show him what I'm, what I'm trying to make the point of. All right, see this hanging out here, guys? That's what we call a fatigue meter. And uh, <laughs> for some dogs, like, listen, they're super high energy and they have uh, super, like, high endurance uh, rates. And so that's what this dog is right here. Uh, she's super high energy. She has a lot of endurance and she has a really quick recharge rate. Now, in full disclosure, I bred this puppy, right? And so, uh, like, as you watched the dog run in and out of the frame over the course of the video, uh, if you watch the puppy videos when, uh, you know, I was tracking these puppies' development, then you, you see what I was going for. I was going for, like, a dog that was full of uh, vigor, you know, and, uh, like, was athletic and pretty aggressive. And you can see in the way that she plays that she ended up living up to all those uh, expectations. Come on, up, up, up. But now there's a downside to that. When you breed a super athletic dog, right, then you have to manage their energy in a very specific way. And so I knew that I was gonna have trouble getting this dog to concentrate on the course with all the other dogs out here while she was full of energy. So I just kind of let her run around and play and do her own thing. And then once she got a little bit tired, I, you know, I knew I'd have a better chance of getting her to focus on the course. Now, the point that I'm going to use this dog to make is that there's a like such a silly concept out there about exercising dogs, and it's called developing a canine super athlete, right? Okay. The theory being that if you come on, babies, that if you take and exercise your dog, then your dog is going to you know build up this incredible athletic reserve that makes them impossible to manage. Okay, that's silly. It takes a tremendous amount of effort and knowledge and foresight to breed dogs to be canine super athletes. You're not just going to take your random run of the mill black lab and go exercise them a few times a day so that they'll be a good dog and turn them into a dog that can't be managed because their energy outputs are all of a sudden through the roof and their endurance levels are all of a sudden through the roof. That's just not going to happen. That's an awful, awful thing to tell people, but I can tell you why people, you know, say it, it's because it's popular. So on the one hand, watch out, up, up. So on the one hand, I kind of want to blame professionals in the dog business for spreading that myth about like the development of a canine super athlete. But in reality, who's to blame is people that want to hear it, right? Because like, you, you know, a lot of times we want to, we, we blame people that sell stuff but it ain't the people selling it that's a, a, that is at as much fault as the people that are buying it, okay? It makes me ashamed when I hear people talk about, well, I don't want to exercise my dog because then it'll need more exercise. It'll become an athlete. That's what you want for your dog. You want your dog to be at the top of their games in terms of mental and physical performance. And if you don't want that for a dog, you shouldn't buy a dog or you shouldn't buy the type of dog that has the capacity or potential to become a canine athlete. Okay, that's just, it's just that simple. I mean, I really want sometimes to just like, like bang my head when I see people talk about that. They talk about, oh, well, a tired dog is a good dog is bad advice. Okay, notice who says that. It's talking heads say that. Not people that live out here like me, that not people that go hiking. I have people that take my online course and they live in apartments you know, and they still do awesome because they're the kind of people, and I run them through a filter so I make sure I don't, uh, you know, end up with any uh, underachievers, but they're achievers, and they buy dogs, even if they buy a high-running uh, high dog like a German short hair, like they, they manage to keep that dog in top shape both physically and mentally, and while they're keeping the dog in shape, it forces them to get out, get moving, and be interested in, and to every, it's the 360-degree win. I'm happy, they're happy, the dog's happy, all the neighbors are happy, okay? So, don't buy into that, oh, uh, exercise your dog, turn it into a canine super athlete. That's nonsense. Just quit saying it, right? Here's what you're saying. If you want to be honest, let's say this. I'm going to not let my dog exercise so that it gets obese and uh, out of shape 
and can't exercise and it makes it easier for me to manage. So I want a slothful dog so I can live a slothful existence. If you say that, I'm not, look, I'm not, who am I to judge? You can be however you want to be. You know, if you want to make your dog like, uh, you know, sick so that you don't need to walk it as much, I mean, I guess that's on you, but at least be honest with what you're doing, okay? So let's just nip that in the bud. And if you, if you disagree with me, write a comment. I'll make another video on this series, and I guess we can hash it out right here in public. All right, now I probably got one more dog to walk in me, uh, so I'm going to go round one up, and uh, we'll end on a, on a fun, happy note. All right, so we'll tie this video together, ending on a point of agreement. Now, I know if you've made it this far in the video, <laughs> surely that you've started to agree with me that your dogs need a lot of exercise, okay? Now, look at these different dogs. Uh, we have different kinds of dogs here, and they all have different, uh, like, base levels of fitness, and so we can hold them all to different standards, but what we want to do is we want to exercise them so that we can help them realize their full potential, okay? <laughs> Now, the dog I'm going to use to finish the video is the one that's laying down here kind of passed out, right? Because we all have the, like, this is like a regular friend group, right? Don't you have friends like this? You've got, uh, like, the super athlete friend that's always running 10Ks and wearing short shorts. Uh, and you got the, uh, the jock athlete, good-looking guy that, or girl, you know, that everybody pays attention to. Uh, and you've got the happy-go-lucky dog friend that everybody wants to meet and know. And, you know, maybe he's not the best athlete but likes to play all the time. Oh, and then you have Norman. And Norman always wants to go, but he wants to drink a beer while everybody else is working hard. <laughs> All right, now, so Norman's owner is a finance guy. He lives in Nashville. <laughs> Come on, Norman. Get off there, big boy. And so, uh, you know, he contacted me a while ago. And what he wanted out of a dog was, uh, you know, he wanted a dog that could go do some adventure stuff but could also uh, navigate uh, and manage living in an urban environment. You know, Nashville is like a big city now. And uh, so the guy that owns him, he's from Colorado, and he's used to kind of big open spaces, but he works a lot. And so he doesn't get a chance to go out and do as much as he wants to. So he needs a dog that has some energy, you know, uh, but doesn't have tons of energy and tons of endurance and too quick of a recharge rate. And to be honest with you, I think Norman's owner is kind of the same, right? And so, like, it's just a matter of making sure that when you, you know, think about your exercise regimen, uh, you, you get started uh, with an objective evaluation of where you are. So, uh, Norman's owner wanted a dog that was friendly and outgoing, but had a moderate amount of energy. Did he get that? Yes. Okay, so that's one hurdle down. Now, the next thing, did he get a pretty early start on the training? Yes. So that's our next hurdle down. So now all we have left to do is to gradually challenge Norman, Norman to uh, higher and higher performance levels uh, by increasing the difficulty of our mental and physical uh, challenges, you know? And that's kind of where we are. Now, if I was working Norman at the early part of this session, then he would be performing with a lot more energy, you know? But since I kind of waited uh, till the end, I have to take that into account and I have to evaluate his success or his progress understanding that a lot of his energy has been expended in the playing field, okay? He's not like some of these higher strung, higher running athletic dogs where he just has these energy reserves he can draw upon. So if you want to get started uh, on a good exercise program with your dog, you start with an objective evaluation uh, and with a plan for preparation, okay? And so if you have a, a dog like Norman, or maybe you are kind of built like Norman, right? then my best advice for you is to start slow and build your way up, okay? So, you know, get out, go for a walk, see how far you can walk without getting winded, you know, and write that down in a little journal. Come on, Norman. And then tomorrow, try to walk a little farther, okay? When you're out doing exercises with your dogs, basically, you have uh, two things that you can control. You can control the duration of your exercise session and you can control the intensity. So, so what I like to do is I like to encourage people to get them a notebook and to go out and start slowly, like I said, okay, 
write down how did you feel when you got back to your house? How did the dog act when you got back to the house? If you go on an adventure with a dog like this and you get back to your house and she's bouncing off the walls, write that down. I walked two miles, I did four activities, I got back to the house, the dog's bouncing off the walls. What's that tell you that you need to do? Tomorrow, walk three miles, so either stay out longer and walk farther, or increase the intensity of the activities that you're engaged with on your walk or doing your exercise session. Now, same thing with you. If you go out, because uh, I don't want anybody having any heart attacks because they're trying to do what Uncle Stoney says. <laughs> you know, if you go out and you go for a walk or you go running with your dog and you start getting out of breath, write that down in your notebook. Okay? Because sometimes we see an imbalance. We see an athletic dog with a, a non-athletic owner. You know? And if that's the case, then what you have to do is you have to be more creative with how you structure the activities of your exercise session. Remember guys, when you're walking, if you're walking on a flat surface, then you take a step, the dog takes some steps, you take, a, that energy expenditure is kind of constant and steady. Okay? Super easy way to get the dog to expend more energy is take them somewhere interesting where they can climb and jump and play and investigate and explore, okay? Because we have two ways to help dogs use energy. We have the physical way, which that's related to the movement and exertion level, and then we have uh, the mental way. And, and, and brains use up a lot of calories, guys. So if you get that dog out and that nose is going a million miles an hour and those ears are going a million miles an hour and they're seeing lots of things, okay? Burning up a lot of calories, okay? so. When in doubt about the balance of your fitness levels, just make your exercise sessions more interesting for the dog and allow the dog to self-regulate. There's room in an exercise regimen for you to self-regulate and the dog to self-regulate, and the only real active parts you have to take is to make sure that your dog is trained well enough not to engage in dangerous, destructive, or rude behavior. If you can just get that out of the way, right? That's your formal training. Get your dog to come when it's called, be still when it's told, have good manners from your neighbor's perspective, and refrain from behavior that's dangerous, destructive, or rude, then there's no excuse or need for you to not go out and exercise your dog in a way that's mutually beneficial, in a way that you enjoy, and in a way that the dog enjoys, and in a way that everybody that comes, in, comes into contact with you as a pair enjoys. Okay, so I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I know I went off in the weeds a little bit, throwing some people under the bus for some what I consider bad advice. Uh, if you don't like that, hey, write a comment below and I'll uh, make another video fleshing out my position. But here's what I wanna leave you with. Get out, get moving, be interesting, enjoy the days that the Lord is blessing you with.